This is uh, March 11th, 2019, and we're at the west gate of Edwards Air Force Base. This is a tour designed for social media, and we mean to be a part of it. We're here at the Armstrong Test Center, and uh, it's a huge facility, a lot of parking. We're going down to the main building. I'm the historian for the center, and I'll be chatting with you once we go inside about something specific, relevant to what you're here to spend the day talking about or talking about. And then I spend the first time trying to keep the heat in. Cold out. looking at or talking and listening to people, other people talk about, uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about the object behind me here. The, it started life as the lunar landing research vehicle. It ended up in this configuration as the lunar landing training vehicle. So what you see now is the final configuration. Uh, in, a, in, in as simple a, a, a nutshell or as simple a story as I can make it, uh, you go back to 1961, you're a NASA engineer, and Kennedy gives the speech about going to the moon, and you're with a bunch of other engineers, and before he's finished giving the speech, they're out of the room because they're rocket engineers, and they're going to the moon, and they want to figure out how to get to the moon, and you're sitting there listening to the speech, and you realize that he figures we're going to get to the moon, but we have to bring the person back from the moon. And that's a matter of finesse. The moon has one-sixth our gravity, but it has no atmosphere. This is 1961. How are you going to train someone to land something on the moon, given those conditions? There are no six degree of freedom simulators in existence then. Computers are the size of rooms for the most part. There are no real portable computers that you can think of now. Um, how are you going to train someone to land on the moon so that they can get home again? That's the, the challenge. And this is what they come up with. It's an odd structure. It's very, very lightweight, as you can tell. Very, very thin aluminum tubing. The, 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 the odd part of the story is that engineers here down the, down the road where you will be going at what was then the NASA Flight Research Center, and engineers at Bell Aircraft in Niagara, New York had the same idea but did not communicate. They weren't in touch with each other. They both realized that you had to have some way of descending and ascending at the same weight here on, on the planet, but you had to have a way of negating gravity as well as eliminating the side forces that you and I are accustomed to. You walk around, a gust of wind comes, you don't pay any attention to it, you simply lean against it. You don't think about it. You have to have a way of eliminating all of these forces that you naturally work against to walk or ride a bicycle and think nothing of. And you have to be able to eliminate these so that this can replicate landing on the moon. How do you do that? in 1961-62. That is your technical challenge. So Bell, which submitted a proposal and won the contract, folks here at the FRC had a very similar idea. When they got together, their proposals looked almost identical. Bell gets the contract, and this is what you wind up with. Down here at the center is a jet engine. It's aligned vertically instead of horizontally this way. It's in a double gimbal, which allows the jet engine to stay vertically aligned while the structure itself essentially can pivot up to 40 degrees in any direction. So the jet will keep you aligned vertically, and this machine will pivot up to whatever, up to 40 degrees, and at the corner are thrusters. And the idea is that the pilot 
pseudo-astronaut will be able to maneuver this thing, pitch, yaw, translate laterally. And there are larger thrusters around the base of the jet engine to replicate vertical descent. So I talked about the absence of computers. And that is not entirely true. This is the three, the two that came out here. This is vehicle two of the two that came from Bell that were assembled and then flown out here for two and a half years. Because the thrust of this jet engine barely, and I do mean barely overcame the weight of the vehicle with the pilot and the stores on board, the, the fuel and the hydrogen peroxide, uh, Bell realized that there was no way they could do this with mechanical controls. So they substituted mechanical controls with a fly-by-wire system. This is the world's first pure fly-by-wire machine, full stop, period. This is the world's first fly-by-wire machine, full stop. It is, however, analog, which means that every time you wanted to reprogram your computer, you got out your soldering iron and you moved wires, because that's how the analog computers worked. And there were three little computers in the way back, and every time the guy up front was manu manu excuse me, manipulating the controls, all he did was send signals to the computer. The computer then sent signals to control the thrust levels, and that's how you flew this thing. Started the jet engine, initiated climb to about 800 to 1,000 feet, pushed a button, which went into lunar simulation. Now the jet thrust was reduced to compensate for five-sixths of the total weight of the vehicle, and now you're falling out of the sky as though you were in lunar gravity. And now it's up to the pilot to arrest the descent and start preparing for a landing, which is what you were going to do in lunar simulation or lunar descent, and this is what you had to prepare for. So now the pilot's using the left stick to control the eight vertical descent thrusters and the right stick that you cannot see to control the corner thrusters to maneuver and then make a landing. Eight minutes is all he had. After eight minutes, he was going to be out of either jet fuel or hydrogen peroxide. He had no warning in the vehicle. Somebody on the ground kept a stopwatch and kept track of this. This is what they trained the astronauts to prepare for landing on the moon. NASA had two additional simulators. One was a fixed space simulator, which means that there was no motion involved. Another was a motion simulator. The fixed space simulator was at the Johnson, now the Johnson Space Center, the Manned Space Flight Center at the time. Uh, it involved uh, sitting at a monitor, a television monitor in one room, and in another room was a very large three-dimensional map of the moon, and then a television camera would descend and traverse over the map depending on where the pilot in the other room was maneuvering this vehicle. So you viewed your descent over the moon, not very realistic. And then the other alternative was at the Langley Research Center. It was a giant <coughs> tree, 400 feet long, 200 feet high, that would suspend by a, by a cable uh, a lunar lander that you could then traverse and make a descent. Neither of those risked a pilot's life. And in the case of the LLTV behind me here, as Gene Cernan said, this one hung your butt out over the line. There was no button you could push to reset. There simply was nothing to say, I would like a do-over. You started, you finished what you started as you would on the moon. There was no chance to do it again. This was the best simulator of them all. Neil Armstrong said when he landed on the moon, in retrospect, he said in, in 72 during a, an interview that when he landed on the moon, it felt like he had done it before because of this. Questions? Where's prototype number one? I'm sorry? Where's prototype number one? Is prototype it? number one does no longer exist. Is that the one you In know? 1968, that's the one that Armstrong ejected from a year, almost a year and a month before he went to the moon. Yes. 
you said this is, this is prototype two? This is prototype two, yes. They subsequently built, after the modifications, Bell then built three additional ones, which were sent directly to Houston, where they were used to train the astronauts. There are two left of the total of five, this and one additional one that hangs from the ceiling of the Johnson Space Center. So prototype one was not fully fly-by-wire in the same way? Oh, they were all fly-by-wire. Okay, so this type, this, okay. These are all fly-by-wire, yes. So as were the Apollo, as were the, the um, uh, Gemini and uh, Mercury, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules. Can you explain the process of the gimbal? Is it a hydraulic or is it a geared mechanism? It's, now that you're challenging me, I have to go back and look at this briefly. <coughs> Ultimately, my question is, does the gimbal slow down as you go into the moon landing mode to respond to the astronaut's motion as versus how it normally would operate, how it's designed to operate? Ask that again. I so when you, when the astronaut goes into lunar landing mode, and it, you indicated that it slows down, the power, power plant slows down. Oh, it wise. reduces the thrust. Right. So does the gimbal slow down as no, well? No, no. It, it, there's no gain change in okay. that. It just reduces the thrust so that the ratio of thrust is, is consistent with what you would experience on Earth. That's what they were trying to do. And uh, what I neglected to mention is that there were sensors around the, the craft that took in data while you were flying that was fed directly to the computer. I made a point of this, but then I didn't follow through, such that the pilot paid no attention to side forces. All that was fed directly to the computer so that a gust of wind came, the pilot paid no attention to it, the computer simply took that data in and would cant the jet enough to compensate for the side forces and the pilot would experience no gust of wind or anything. It was as though, and this is my um, analogy so it may not be entirely accurate, but it is as though you were in a three-dimensional air hockey table. Once you start moving, you're going to move until you stop yourself, and no side force is going to cause you to move somewhere else. That's the whole point of these sensors, bringing them in, bringing the data in to give you as realistic uh, a flight in an environment-less world as you can without side forces. Yes? Is the eight, minute, eight minutes of fuel or thrust more on Earth or on the moon? Here. Okay. That's all they supplied here. Okay. Uh, they had the total amount that was limited in, to, in terms of seconds when they be, once they began their descent to the moon. I forget exactly how many seconds they had, but yeah. Yeah, the eight minutes was just here. Anything else? Do you know who, uh, who made the jet engine for this one? Yes, it's uh, CFM 700. It's the... It's the Fanjet version of the J85. Okay. And in fact, they acquired the very first um, uncertified Fanjet versions to put in this because they had the right thrust to weight ratio and it concerned NASA that they were using uncertified engines. But they used them instead of the J85s because they had a better thrust to weight ratio. Just enough to get them in the air. What's the, uh, what's the package weight? So it, it varied a little bit, but the total, the all up weight was just over 3,000 pounds. Just over. What else can I tell you? You want to know the ejection seat. The ejection seat was a where did it come from? Part, or what, what aircraft did it, it come from? It came from the Weber company down in LA. They no longer exist. Uh, it started out as just a basic ejection seat, and over time they changed it to a zero zero. And then it was a zero zero, and then it went to a negative, so that you could actually leave it and get out while it was descending and still leave uh, and, and escape safe. Because this thing tended to fall out of the sky rapidly. So. How did the fly-by-wire system in this feed into later? Ah, uh, so the engineers from this project, after two and a half years of working on this, figured that 
they could transfer their experience to something with wings. And they sought approval and received approval to apply their experience to an airplane. And so the airplane of choice that they had access to was an F-8. Uh, as you go to the center, you will see uh, two F-8s parked on display. One of them says digital fly-by-wire on the side. What they did was they stripped all of the flight controls out of the F-8, which were hydromechanical. They pulled out all of the hydromechanical hydro controls from the F-8. They put in servo motors at the controls area in the airplane. They ran wires to the servos. They put in a computer, and then they went to fly the airplane. So they made it a pure digital fly-by-wire airplane to demonstrate the fact that they were confident in a fly-by-wire system within the atmosphere to fly an airplane. Um, the Air Force was doing much the same thing with an F-4, but they were grafting a fly-by-wire system onto an existing, rather than pulling out a pre-existing system, they were grafting it onto the system that existed. NASA took it out altogether and went to fly the F-8 with that system. As an aside, they did not have a suitable digital computer. And they made that known when they went to headquarters for approval. And they mentioned this to the associate, uh, gee, I forget what his title was. They mentioned this to a fellow who had some authority uh, that they lacked a suitable digital computer. And he said, well, I think I can get you one. Uh, I flew it. I just came back from the moon with one. Uh, his, this was Neil Armstrong. And he said, I, I suggest you use the Apollo guidance computer. It's pretty good. It's got the best mean time between failure of any portable digital computer. And we have some extras. And so that's what they put into the F-8. They put an Apollo guidance computer into the F-8, and that's what they used to fly the F-8. Does anybody here know how powerful the Apollo guidance computer was? Apollo guidance computer, this is what they went to the moon with. An Apollo guidance computer, while well, a digital computer had a whopping 38K <laughs> of memory, of which 36 was read only. And this is what they flew that F-8 with. So the transfer of technology was from this to the F-8 to the F-16, which the first F-16s were analog fly-by-wire to digital fly-by-wire. Now you hop on, except for 737s, all of the 777s and 787s and Airbuses and Christian Lee are fly-by-wire. Uh, if you buy a new car, your brakes are drive-by-wire. Your steering is increasingly drive-by-wire. Your shifting is drive-by-wire. Your accelerator is drive-by-wire. There are increasingly few components that are mechanically linked in your car uh, as a result of this technology transfer. So you are seeing, even on a Harley Davidson motorcycle, increasingly the throttle no longer links by cable to the engine. It's just a twist, send an electronic signal, engine goes zoom. So that's what's happening. So concept-wise, we're now looking at going back to the moon. How would we change this for astronauts today to practice landing on the moon? What would we need to do to make it <laughs> more realistic? So I'm thinking that the question you've asked is one better addressed later this morning or today during the course of the events, because I think you will have a chance to ask that of people who have participated in conferences that have addressed this very question. Uh, you know, the, I was very impressed with the parents of this.